My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. I launched Destination Unlimited because of my lifelong fascination with both science and spirituality and how these two disciplines intersect. Archaeology is the science that studies human history through the excavation of ancient sites and the analysis of artifacts found at those sites. Some of those sites and the artifacts found within them have had curses, possession, and other negative entities attributed to them. Is this real? Can the archaeological record prove the existence of demons and malevolent entities? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Dr. Heather Lynn, is an expert in this field, and what she has to share may surprise you. Heather Lynn is a true Renaissance woman with multiple accomplishments in many fields. She's an author, historian, and renegade archaeologist on a quest to uncover the truth behind ancient mysteries. She holds numerous degrees and certificates in both history and archaeology and is a member of professional organizations including the American Historical Association, the Society for Historical Archaeology, Association of Ancient Historians, and the World Archaeological Congress. She left a life in academia to pursue her fascination with the unexplained and now investigates ancient mysteries, lost civilizations, hidden history, ancient aliens, and the occult. Heather's work exposes our hidden history, challenging the accepted narrative found in mainstream history books. In addition to appearances on radio programs like Coast to Coast AM and Fade to Black, Heather's been a historical consultant for television programs, including history's ancient aliens. In her spare time, she plays the French horn in a local symphony orchestra whose performances raise money to provide art and cultural education to low-income communities. She loves tennis, classical music, and a good cup of tea. Her website is drheatherlynn.com, and she joins me this week to discuss her new book, Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. Please welcome to Destination Unlimited, Dr. Heather Lynn. Good evening, Heather. Good evening. How are you tonight? I am wonderful, and thank you so much for joining us. You know, I outlined your amazing list of accomplishments and activities. What do you do on Tuesdays? <laughs> <laughs> I talk to very interesting people. <laughs> thank you. Well, seriously, let's look at how your path evolved. Please share with our listeners your story, how you arrived at this career and calling. Oh, well, um, they call me the renegade archaeologist because I did not continue to follow the vocational path of traditional academia. Uh, I, I actually dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old. I traveled the country and explored a lot of different things. I, I was sort of on a spiritual quest, I think, looking back. I visited a lot of churches and temples and was sort of trying to find myself and uh, you know, as a result, I ended up uh, <laughs> finding out that I needed to do a little bit more than that with my life as a teenager. And so I, I did end up going back to school, of course, when I was in my early 20s and started in uh, community college. And it was there that I started to discover archaeology and the importance of archaeology. Uh, I worked with disadvantaged youth, um, teaching them sort of the appreciation of their past and how archaeology can really bring people together. And that was something that was a new idea for me, you know, looking at archaeology as something other than just Indiana Jones or something fun like that. I, I found that archaeology is an area where people can join and getting excited about learning who they are and, and why they're here. And so I, I, it really intrigued me. And I'd always had a love of history since I was a, a really young child. And so I, I continued on, of course, and got my bachelor's and studied history and got my master's from that. And I, I just went on. But I, during this whole time, I had a fascination with sort of 
unknown or strange or sometimes fringe topics, as they call them. And this came from that experience that I had having left home. As a runaway, I spent a lot of time traveling, and part of that travel included listening to late night radio, hearing all sorts of different stories of alien abductions or, you know, those sorts of things, and then compiled with the experiences I had on the road, speaking to people in diners or truck stops or any of these spiritual centers that I visited, I learned that the, the, the world, the country, of course, but even the world was just full of amazing mysteries and anomalies, and it just really had me hooked. But I just sort of kept that under my hat while I went through school, and it was when I went to uh, one of my first archaeology classes, uh, they put up on the board a list of names of what they called pseudo-archaeologists, and part of our assignment was that we had to debunk them and their theories. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, but I recognized some of the names on the board as people I had read or heard. And I, while I didn't agree with all of their theories, I didn't really want to call them pseudo-archaeologists. So I, you know, that stuck with me as well. And then as I just went on, I found that there was a very close-mindedness about academia, and then I got very disenchanted with some of the work that I was doing um, in, the, in the background with regards to grant writing and some of the corruption I saw. And this was just at a small, small level, too. I, it wasn't, you know, it started, at, like I said, a community college, and then I went to a state school, and so it wasn't anything that you would expect. And so I thought, wow, if this sort of corruption and close-mindedness and negativity was infiltrating these you know, these regular colleges and universities, then God help us, really. And so I, I, I thought, well, what should I do about that? And I thought, well, what I'm going to do is just, you know, stay stay strong and get through this and hold on to my convictions and, and come out. And instead of pursuing this traditional path of tenure and, and whatnot, I thought I'm going to go out and search for answers on my own, but use the scientific methodologies and the you know, scholarly practices that I'd acquired in university to do them, uh, do them proper justice, if you will. And so that's what I do now. Now, your calling also led you to becoming an ordained minister and earning a doctorate in comparative religion. Have you found commonalities in the different faiths? I have, I have. That is something that uh, I, I have definitely found. I, I, I got my, I got I had two doctorates. One of them um, was in education, and the other is in, um, as you said, comparative religion. And that one was this idea of uh, soul searching. As, as I started out when I was younger, looking at these different faiths and traditions, I was very intrigued. I, I was raised Catholic, but I'd always been a seeker. And so this was an extension of that spiritual spiritual journey was doing the, you know, research into comparative religion and then becoming an ordained minister. It's uh, not something that I talk a lot about, and so I'm really glad you were able to bring it up. Some people don't ask, and so um, it is something that is meaningful to me. I am on a spiritual quest, and and I like to share that with people as well. But part of that quest, I found that there are very, very similar ideas. Uh, there's a string or a thread of truth, I think, that's woven through all of these beautiful religious traditions and cultures that we've seen through history. And I think that's important to focus on those as opposed to those things that make us different. Yeah, if you look beyond the dogma and some of the cultural parts of different faiths and religions, you find the basic message, which is the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, love thy neighbor as thyself. Absolutely. It's it, And the ubiquity of the golden rule is really something fascinating when you take a look at it. It's You can see it through Buddhism. They, you know, it hurt not others with that pains thyself. I mean, different wordings and there's classical paganism. Plato discussed it. Um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Um, there's even a Pima proverb that discusses uh, do not wrong or hate your neighbor for it is not he who you wrong but yourself. So regardless of the wording, it all sort of comes down to that that idea of the universality of the golden rule. It's fascinating when you really take a look at those eternal truths that are behind it all. That's true. And if we all looked at each other as brothers and sisters and loved each other as thy neighbor and thyself, then we'd have a totally different planet to be living <laughs> on right now. Indeed. Now, let's discuss some of your earlier work. Your best-selling report, The Sumerian Controversy, deals with a major discovery that the power elite wants hidden from the world. What was that discovery, and why the secrecy? Ah, uh, yes. This one uh, was probably another one of those 
aha moments for me when I just initially started out on my own and and um, was off the heels of of understanding that there was some level of corruption within you know the academic industrial complex, but I did not realize how nefarious some of this could be until I was contacted by a gentleman in March of 2013 uh, discussing how he had seen people in his hometown of Iraq um, carrying out artifacts. Um, and, and he was very upset about it and he, he was asking me to help and, you know, I felt powerless. I wasn't sure what I could do. And so at that point I thought, well, I'm going to have to investigate a bit further to see a, if he was being telling the truth and B, if there was anything to even tell if this was just, you know, (laughs) traditional archeology span happening, or if this was something a little deeper. And what I found was that it was, it was very disturbing what was going on. And what was that? The archaeological excavation that was going on in Iraq um, was being funded by big oil companies, elite families who had a penchant for um, collecting and selling antiquities, and um, other big business organizations that were going in there and and, um, basically taking the artifacts and uh, (laughs) using a university in a way to sort of, I would say, launder the money through this organization having the university do the work, but the people who are funding it were um, big energy, big oil uh, individuals and families. And so uh, I found that to be a conflict of interest, and I exposed that in this report. And did they appear to want to hide this? Yes, and for various reasons as well. Um, So each person sort of had their own motivation, I would say, behind why. So one would be that they wanted to take the the good things for themselves um, and other things. Well, I think they may have been looking for um, ancient technologies, perhaps. Uh, There's a lot of different ways you could look at it. But I know that um, this was a very secretive exchange. And it was a very big budget excavation. And They didn't like me poking around, I'll just say that. (laughs) (laughs) My guest is Dr. Heather Lynch. She's the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. We'll be back with more of Heather after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Tune in to The Practical Intuitive, Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition, animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more. All to help you tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Art Council. When you shop Goodwill, you don't just bring home a vintage dress or cat lamp. You bring home so much good to your community, because everything you buy funds local job training and more. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening is Dr. Heather Lynn. She's the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. Um, Heather, your last book was called Anthrotheology, Searching for God in Man. Please tell us about that book. Well, that book was a a, a personal project, sort of. Uh, it, at least it started as that. It, it was based on my quest to try to understand those things we spoke of earlier, that common thread between religions and practices. And so, I, I you know, what I what I learned in my studies of anthropology is that there's 
there are some human universals. There's there's few that we can definitively say, but it's worth looking at to say that, well, there are some things that we can say we all share as humans. And so I, I sort of embark on this idea of what is what is consciousness? And so the idea of anthrotheology, um, you know, firstly, anthro comes from uh, the Greek for human or man, and then theo from the Greek meaning a deity, and then logi, of course, for the English adaptation for the Greek um you know, which is meaning of speaking or teachings. And so, in a way, it's just this idea of the study of or the speaking of God and man. And so, it's a a little strange, but I I look at, it's a way to sort of describe what was going on in my head when I wrote the book. It examines artifacts um, and a myriad of questions uh, such as, can the voice of God be in man, found in man? So it, not, in, not in a way that someone would literally hear voices, but sort of what is that internal voice? I look at the work of Julian Jaynes, who is a um, a very interesting person who I think is is a very under-recognized scholar who was ahead of his time. Uh, he was a Princeton psychologist that also had an interest in anthropology and history. And he wrote about the idea of a bicameral mind, this idea that somehow consciousness came from this this splitting of, of our mind in, in a physical sense in a way where we would hear or remember voices and from our ancestors that we would adopt as our own voice. And, you know, just some interesting, strange ways of looking at what this internal voice is. I, I look at those things. I look at literature. It's a basically a comparative analysis of literature, prehistoric art, and just trying to find what is consciousness if you look at it in the context of a god or some sort of um, divine inspiration speaking through us. The question of is there a way that a human being by themselves without dogma, could they have within them the ability to hear, properly hear and understand this divine message? And if so, have they been telling us this all along through the art and, and prehistoric paintings and uh, monuments and, and cultural uh, cultural artifacts that we have today, going all the way up to some of the parchments in the Library of Alexandria. And so it's a, it's just basically a, an exploration of the history of thought about consciousness. It's something that I, I did as a personal quest to even be able to study and look at those questions, because as we mentioned before, you know, having that, that sort of pull that to, to look at things in a more spiritual way, that's something that is really... You know, it, it's something that is my calling, I guess, if you will. That, that concept of the voice of the ancestors, is that something like genetic memory? A bit, yeah, a bit. Um, th- there is an idea proposed that uh, we didn't quite understand when ancestors were gone, that if we, it, it, say for instance, if you remember the voice of your mother telling you, don't go near that pond, or, you know, don't do not do this or don't do that. Um, but then your mother dies. But it, now, instead of her voice, you just know, I shouldn't go near the pond or don't. But before our language was as complex, when it was very simple language, utterances and, and you know, just sounds, um, the, the, the idea is that it's possible that we didn't recognize that that was our own internal voice, that we still were hearing the voice and attributing it to an ancestor, thereby, you know, lending credence to the um, known phenomenon of ancestor worship in, in ancient cultures. Um, so, but when, at, at what point, if this was happening, the question becomes, when did this idea of these were their voices in the head, you know, or is it my voice? And so you look at shamanism then as an example of, okay, well, the ancestor, so for instance, my mother told me not to go near the pond, but then, you know, if all these people are dying, um, eventually, you may have the elder in your group who has the memory of all of the people before because they just, you know, are older, so they have these memories. So they're able to then have the ability to tell other people, this is what the ancestor said, this is what. And so it becomes sort of a, an element of power and influence and, and that they were wise because they could speak to the ancestors. But were they actually contacting the ancestors or were they just having a memory? But this idea of the consciousness wasn't fully developed or understood as being their own sense of self coming up with these ideas or having memories that 
they would just pop into their brain um, and then they attributed it to the voices that they remembered or understood in, in real time. And it's, it's a little strange, but there's a neurological and physiological root for it that is uh, uh, located and in, involving the corpus callosum. And so there's, there's incidences of people having problems with their corpus callosum where they then don't have an ability to um, have complex language or thoughts and it, it sort of mimics this idea of the ancient man and um, some of the people who have you know looked into this theory they they use literature very old literature like maybe the epic of Gilgamesh or um, Homeric epics to sort of point out that there is a different way people spoke that it was a little less personalized it wasn't coming from a place of personal experience as much as as it seemed observational so it's a little speculative in that sense but some of the more scientific approaches do have it anchored in um, not only psychiatry or psychology but n neurophysics and um, neurology as well and so it's, it's quite interesting and strange at the same time how would that account for biblical prophecy Yes, that's something that, um, you know, researchers have looked into and thought, well, perhaps the prophets were the people who had the ability to not only have the collective memory of, of people that, you know, they, they actually had encountered or had a, had a good memory, but they understood and somehow were able to have this unified sense of self and then, you know, spoke these truths throughout um, you know, the people. So it's this idea of shamanism again, but then the question remains, well, then how did they, what was, what made them a prophet versus a shaman? And so in that case, it, it really is a, a gap in that research line. And so it, um, in, in my assessment, looks more uh, related to the Akashic records and that sort of thing. So when it comes to prophecy, um, that there might have been some other way that they could tap into that externalized information. And that then has to do with, well, what are the bounds of our consciousness? Is it something, just an internal process that is involving just neurological processes in our brain and our, our perceptions? Or could this consciousness then, you know, be something exterior as well? Which I think that, you know, it could very well be something that's both internalized and externalized. Cloud consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's all stored in the cloud, the cosmic cloud. <laughs> the cosmic cloud. <laughs> so let's talk about your new book. Uh, what possessed you to write your new book, Evil Archaeology? Well, oddly enough, it was the movie The Exorcist. Ah. Uh, the beginning scene from both the book and the movie is set in Iraq at an archaeological excavation. Um, at the site, there's a priest archaeologist that will, he feels this strong wind blowing and it foreshadows the arrival of the demon that possesses the the girl in the story. Um, the demon that is featured is um, the demon that's actually on the cover of the book, Pazuzu. And the demon Pazuzu is a Mesopotamian demon of the southwest wind. And so I thought, oh, when I saw this movie, I remember seeing it when I was younger uh, and being raised Catholic. Of course, I was not allowed to see it, but I did. And so I, so I, it stuck with me as strange, but I saw it again on cable. And as an adult now and an archaeologist, that, that scene just sort of stuck with me. I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? And it wasn't long after seeing the movie then that I had read a news story that caused me to pause. Uh, on October 5th, 2014, uh, sheriff's deputies in North Carolina uh, raided a suburban home and discovered the remains of two men that had been missing for a while. And uh, it seemed at first like just sadly a run-of-the-mill news story until I heard the name of the killer was Pazuzu. <laughs> Oh, and, I, and then I, so I thought, wait a second, how how weird! I just watched this movie, and so you know, a bit serendipitously, I I had to now listen to the story more, and so I found that before legally changing his name from John Lawson, this Pazuzu uh, grew up in the suburbs of Clemens, North Carolina, and struggled with a lot of issues. Clearly, but uh, he ended up making up a an idea of what he figured was a Sumerian religion. Um, it wasn't really based in actual history, but he had sort of historical elements associated with it. And uh, part of that then was his idea that he had to make a monthly blood sacrifices of at first a small animal until that then went into um, sacrificing the neighbors. So he would get the neighbors and sacrifice them, butcher them, cannibalize them, and so forth. And uh, he had to do this to 
appease the demons and uh, honor Pazuzu. So this made me question, wow, you know, Mesopotamian demons, could they still dwell among us in some way, shape, or form, and maybe even possess people? I mean, clearly the killer was 100% to blame for what he did, but it started making me wonder, when he said he was inspired, I thought of the word inspire, and how that comes from the Latin inspirare, meaning to breathe or blow into, and uh, the, the word usually described when specifically a supernatural being imparted an idea to somebody. And so this then related to the concept of doing something in spirit or in the spirit of. And I thought it may be splitting hairs over semantics, but could it have been enough to just the idea of being inspired by this demon? Could that have been enough alone to constitute the existence of demons? So it, it started me off on this journey then to look into um, the place and the, the, the evolution of the idea of demons and how we look at them in the world today. Um, and, and sort of, you know, it, can they be in things, p- people, places? And I, I, I was surprised at what I found out, actually. And so, you know, it, it, it turned into a full-size book. <laughs> and so it all wow. stemmed from The Exorcist. Wow. My guest is Dr. Heather Lynch. is the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. Heather, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about your work. They can find out everything at www.drheatherlynn.com, and they can get the book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's pretty much everywhere good books are sold, and it's in Kindle format, paperback, and audiobook. And we'll be back with more of Heather and Evil Archaeology after these words on the Own Times Radio Network. You're listening to OTRFM. Part of the IOM Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Have you bought into the idea that you have to work hard for your money, that business is hard? I will share some dynamic access consciousness tools to get you out of your own way so you can create a business that actually succeeds. Join me, Simone Millicis, on The Joy of Business at 4 p.m. Mondays Eastern. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting. A Teenager. Learning the Lingo. Goat. G-O-A-T, acronym, stands for greatest of all time. As in spaghetti sandwiches for dinner? They're my fave. Dad, you're the goat. You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Visit AdoptUSKids.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening is Dr. Heather Lynch. He's the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. So what is the historical origin of the concept of demons, and does it predate the Abrahamic religions? Yes, it it, it does. It, we're not really sure how far back, but there is evidence that there it could have gone as far back as prehistory. Uh, many ancient people believe that drilling a hole in the head could allow imprisoned spirits or demons or any supernatural beings that could be in there to escape. And this uh, this process was called trepanning. It's the oldest surgical procedure. It dates back to the Paleolithic era. Um, so they have a specimen that, that dates back at least 60,000 years. Um, and so 
There are, there are other explanations offered for treponine that we know it, it can be used to relieve intracranial pressure and some other things. But one of them is also the idea that the spirits were in the head and that you could allow them to be released. But probably a more recognizable depiction of, of demons and this sorts of the sort of thing that we would relate to now from popular cultural senses or Abrahamic religions even would be found as far back as 4,000 years ago in Sumerian cuneiform tablets. Archaeologists have found uh, many Mesopotamian medical texts that outline exorcism rites that appear very similar to those of the uh, Catholic Church. So about 1,000 cuneiform tablets that the British Museum has on file, 660 of those specifically reference um, forms of exorcism to get rid of demons. And so what it's, it's, it's this idea of demons that you can see forming, and they take form and they take shape. And you'll see these depictions uh, looking a lot like uh, sort of chimera creatures, uh, man and, and animal and all of the exacerbated features that you would look at an animal and think were scary. So claws and large teeth and, you know, but they were anthropomorphic. And so you, you see them taking shape, but quite literally. And then, um, you know, it, it wasn't until much later that we have um, more uh, textual representation of them. And then even, you know, illustrations or pictures uh, that, you know, sort of look similar to what we think of now. A lot of that came from, the literal demonization of pagan deities from the the church, the early church, where they would take figures like Pan, the Greek god, and look at that and say, well, Pan represented fertility and music and drunkenness and things that people would generally associate as, you know, fun or <laughs> being bad and naughty, um, sinful, of course. And so they would look at that and say, well, you know, this is this is a representation of what would happen if you did those things as well. And um, so that's where we get the idea. Pan, of course, looks like the devil. There's a cloven hoof and, you know, horns, half human, half goat. And so, um, you know, and I think that's something very important. They started to lump the uh, beliefs and cultural fears into beasts and evil and magic and monsters. And um, I, I think when you look at Abrahamic religions is, you know, very early on, according to the Bible, man was made in the image of God himself, which is very important. So by depicting demons as animal-human hybrids, artists, especially in medieval times, created what could be called a bestial perversion of God's image. And that that in and of itself was sort of heretical and, and terrible. And so, um, you know, you see this this demonization of these pagan gods. And that's where we get our our ideas now of what devils look like and that sort of thing. Um, and so the idea, though, the underlying piece of that is still what 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 are these? I mean, because people have seen things that maybe look demonic or but they don't always. And so in in uh, in. Um, you know, Islam, they have jinn, and jinn are not necessarily these sort of animal-human hybrid creatures or whatnot. They are um, described as smokeless flames, so they're like light beings, but then they can also be shapeshifters. And so there's this whole host of different ways that these evil entities can appear. It just so happens that our sort of modern idea of them are almost caricatures of what the medieval church you know, sort of did to the pagan deities of the time. Um, but depictions and beliefs go as far back that we know of historically four to 6,000 years and possibly as far back as prehistory. Let's talk a little bit more about ancient Mesopotamia and the Sumerian concept. Where do you think that developed from? The concept of demons? From the Sumerian demons, the Mesopotamian. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally think, and this is just, I don't have strong evidence for this, and so I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I think that some of it had to do, perhaps, with, um, you know, what the, the mainstream anthropological view of it would be, which is what I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of taking the idea of, of, of man and, and defiling it somehow by, you know, creating these images of man-beast hybrids, um, especially since, 
you know, during the time they were going through a transitional period between hunter-gatherer and civilization and building their big cities. And so there may have been a point where people were looked at as very civil and human, and then there could have been a, you know, coexistence with an earlier man or, or a different uh, maybe Neanderthal type where they would be the wild man. You see this depiction in the Epic of Gilgamesh with Enkidu may, being human-like, but not quite. And so this, this idea might have been frightening to people, but um, I think that to really get the idea of, well, where do these entities come from in a spiritual sense and not just a, you know, how would they be depicted? Um, I, I really think that there may have been a possibility that they had encountered altered states of consciousness, whether it be through some sort of meditative practices, spiritual practices, or perhaps even the use of psychedelics. So they may have found some sort of, you know, I mean, they were agrarian by that point and so there's ergot the uh, mold that will grow on grains when 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 it's stored yes. improperly or for a long time they may have had access to that i mean it's very clear they they could have um but there's also things like of course mushrooms or or what have you so um i think that there may have been a point where they have in, they encountered these things and possibly i don't want to say i don't want to use the term expanded their mind because i don't think that's a very adequate or productive way of, of saying what psychedelics do to people because they can be very harmful to the brain. They can be very harmful to people. And I don't think it's a good thing to say they expand it. Um, but I think they do change in a way or open or lift a veil to a different reality. And perhaps through that or just simply meditative practices or, you know, highly developed spiritual practices that we don't know of, they were able to contact entities whether those entities were good or bad i think that's something that's interesting when you look at the history of mesopotamian ideas of demons they weren't always bad <clears throat> excuse me they were uh, they had good qualities which is really difficult for us now to think of but an example would be pazuzu um, people the reason we have so many pazuzu statuettes and, and figures is because people wanted those statues around them. They wanted to wear the amulets as protection, protection specifically against Pazuzu's wife, Lamashtu, who was supposedly a very angry and jealous woman who couldn't have children of her own. So she would take the children of, you know, pregnant women or newborn babies, and that would explain how they died. And so a pregnant woman or a new mother would definitely want to have a Pazuzu statue nearby, to protect her from Lamashtu, because since it was her husband, you know, he would usually be depicted as beating her into submission to tell her, don't, don't take the baby. And so, you know, you see this idea as well with the um, King Solomon and, and some of the grimoires of him summoning demons to help him build the temple. Of course, it didn't work out well for him in the end. Um, it usually never does. But that's sort of the idea in the ancient world is that these demons, these entities, while perhaps inherently bad, could have been utilized for good. And so the, the lure to, to sort of summon them was there. And it was, it's literally playing with fire. So they would perhaps summon these things through channeling or all these different means that they could. And, and uh, you know, maybe it would work out giving them technology or, you know, inspiration or scientific information. And then, you know, Maybe it wouldn't work out after a while. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, nobody writes for free. So I think that might be where we get the idea of temptation. Yeah. You know, where see all the things that you could have and believe in me. And, you know, most religions, when they look at these entities, they refer to them as tricksters. And Christianity is the father of lies. But that, that thread sort of runs through the fabric of that story where, you know, these entities can seem very helpful and good and but it's a lie. It's a, it's an illusion. And so we have to be careful with how we, we mess with them. You know, is there any scientific proof or explanation of purported demons and demonic activity? S scientific proof um, of demonic activity. It's, it's really hard to say because there are ways that you can pick up on different energy fields and things using sort of scientific methodology. I interview in the book, I interview a paranormal investigator who actually uses tools um, to pick up on uh, different temperature changes and, and those sorts of things in an environment. Uh, so there's that. But those are also very, um, you know, 
people people kind of argue about that a little bit so it's it's not i wouldn't call it hard science but i do know in morocco and this is something i cover in the book as well um, there are actually scientists who are researching and have been researching the existence of demons since the 90s and the way they look at it is that they think certain diseases are actually demonic spirits that get into the human body and they look at it as a sort of a germ theory of demonology they think the human body um is in a in a way able to contact these demons or have these demons come in that are very small and they're very much like molecules and so um they it it sounds you know weird and interesting but what's i think even more fascinating is that they have really spent a lot of time and resources at their university studying this and found that they have been able to devise a mathematic formula that will predict the movement and behavior of demons and they've done a, a lot of different like lab testing and things to, you know, model this out theoretically. Um, and so there, there are people out there who definitely believe that it's worth looking into the, the existence of demons. And um, so, yes, some people are looking at it scientifically. Is there proof? Um, there's evidence, mm. not necessarily proof. Well, mathematics bedevils a lot of people. So what you said makes a lot of sense. <laughs> My guest is Dr. Heather Lynn. She's the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. We'll be back with more of Heather after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom! Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening is Dr. Heather Lynn. She's the author of Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possessions, and Sinister Relics. So let's talk a little bit about exorcism. What is the historical record concerning exorcisms? Oh, it, it is very uh, more extensive than than you may think. Off, you know, just the the idea of exorcism that's portrayed as a is strictly Abrahamic thing now, but it, it's really not. And as I mentioned before, um, there's cuneiform tablets that outline um, exact ways that the Mesopotamians uh, carried out exorcism. Um, one method, which is kind of funny and interesting, is that they used modeling clay figures and made little demons and they put them out for battle. So they sort of, it was like a primitive game of rock'em sock'em robots in a way. The priest would instruct the patient to make a figurine of the demon and then the patient would raise his hand and say, that unknown ghost, I have made a figurine of him. Then the priest would 
purify a clay pit by putting wheat flour into it and the next morning would say i will buy clay from the potter's pit for a representation of whatever is evil you pinch off the clay and make figurines of the male and female witch and the patient would present the figures that they had made and pray that the demon takes the clay figures as a substitute by like leaving his body sort of like a scapegoat Mm -hmm. and so the uh, ancient texts actually describe how to make these little clay figurines and uh, you were to take the clay from a potter's wheel and mix it with tallow and wax and say three times to the evil spirits this figure is quote like myself his flesh is like the appearance of my flesh i have mixed clay from the pure mountains tallow and wax i have made a representation of him and then you would pose the figure and even feed it and say eat this you are my substitute drink you have been provisioned a dowry and and it's just you you just go on and demand that this little demon just eats and and drinks and it was quite funny in a way but then the spirit supposedly entered the clay figure and a a separate clay figure then of an adversarial demon would be placed in front of it so that they could do battle which was again why it was so important for them to have these figurines and statues because some of them played an important part in the exorcism process itself um, which is is I think I, it's funny when you think about it. it. It looks like maybe some people were playing with these little toys in a way. But um, another method of purification was to make a funerary offering to the spirit, such as bread, beer, or water usually. The patient would take the skull of a dog, sadly, and fill it with beer and then pour beer onto the ground and dedicate it to the demon. In this particular method, the demon would be drawn to the foods and then lured out of the patient. And so so if it didn't work, you would try to find which foods that this demon may like even more. So maybe in addition to bread, you would have cake or something more enticing. And so, um, you know, they they didn't believe in one type of spirit in in, uh, Sumer. They believed in entities similar to demons, devils, and and ghosts, too. Um, But all of those could enter a person through possession. Um, And some of the demons even, and this is an interesting uh, differentiator, uh, they were underworld beings that were simply sad or lost souls that somebody maybe in their their previous life would have been abused or neglected. And so those sad, lost souls of the abused or neglected people would go on to sort of uh, inhabit or possess people in a way. Um, and, and so it, it took an element of, of firmness to get rid of the demons, but also some sort of compassion because you'd have to figure out, well, what, you know, it reminds me a bit of the movie, The Poltergeist, where, you know, there's these lost souls or, or some of those ideas of, you know, that you see in these ghost stories where they're ghosts, they're lost, and trying to get over to the other side. And the, you know, person, in this case, the exorcist has to tell them to go to the other side and go to the other side. And so, um, you know, they they sort of had a mix of those beliefs, too. Um, But then something that was also very interesting was that the exorcist needed to know the name of the demon, just like an exorcist in popular culture movies would be depicted now, demanding, you know, let me know your name. Or even just like, you know, in the Bible, uh, when Jesus is exercising the man and and you know putting the the demons into the the swine that end up jumping off the cliff, you know asking what what is their name or demanding the name or even just the demon offering the name, um, this this idea of the naming the demon was important because in the ancient days they believed that. This was not just spiritual, but medical. It was a healing practice. And so the name was actually the diagnosis. So if a patient was presenting symptoms of of nausea or chills and weakness, um, the healing rite or exorcism uh, would, would be needed in order to determine and diagnose what specific demon or disease it was so that they knew which thing they needed to do. So whether it was making the little clay figurines or offering the beer or doing something with the sad lost souls. Either way, they knew they needed to know the name of that demon, and so they demanded to know the demon. And uh, there's a depiction of that in what's called the Mesopotamian Hell Plaque that can be found at the Louvre Museum in Paris that shows this very nicely. It's a, it's actually Pazuzu himself holding out a tablet, and in the image there's the netherworld, and 
it has Lamash too and Pazuzu fighting. And on top of that, there's a picture of a patient lying on a bed and priest at either side. And it, it's 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 very uh, almost comic strip like, but it is very very telling and descript. Um, but their methods were were very in some ways strange, but in some ways very similar to what exorcists do today. And the concept of knowing the name. Once you know the name, you also have power over it, right? Yes. That power, of course, would enable you to understand what you're dealing with, how powerful it was, and what maybe uh, weapons, if you will, you could use against it. Um, and so definitely it was about um, power and understanding. Are curses real and are ancient relics and artifacts imbued with them? Mm. And that was like the million-dollar question here. I uh, look at a lot of different artifacts and a lot of different um, household objects that are commonly thought to be either haunted or possessed. And uh, I, I didn't find a, a lot of evidence um, for that. However, I was just looking at some of the stories, and uh, that's when I interviewed the uh, paranormal investigator, Mike Ricksecker, um, to, to tell me sort of his experiences with that. And I, 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 I present that in the book as well. Um, you know, and so there have been cases where these artifacts or objects have at least, if they, if they don't have a specific demon inside that can be totally proven, um, they, they have been known to exhibit strange behavior, strange characteristics, and then even strange readings on different um, meters that they would use. Um, so different heat mapping or different um, vibrations or even sounds can be picked up. And so, you know, again, I, with the whether it's proof, I don't know that it would be proof per se, but there could be evidence to suggest that some sort of energy can attach itself. I also discuss this with an, um, a modern day exorcist in the book uh, named Bill Bean. And I asked him what he thought of that because he's had a lot of experiences in this realm. And he, he was very adamant in saying that, yes, the objects can definitely harbor these evil entities. And so he recommended that most people, if they take in an old object in from a, maybe an antique or, you know, flea market, that they should maybe have it blessed or say a prayer over it or do something for good measure um, because they could perhaps have some sort of negative energy attached to it, if not an evil entity itself. And so I would say that there, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that. Uh, but some of the more blatant um, examples are generally able to be debunked. So I look at the instance of the Crying Boy paintings. Um, those were a set of paintings that came out commercially in the 1950s that uh, were very popular. And it was a, a picture of a sad boy looking like he was crying, of course, hence the name. And they were implicated in a, in a host of fires over decades where – you know, the house would completely burn down into a pile of ashes and what would be remaining would be a picture of this crying boy. And after a while, people started to blame the picture itself. And uh, it became so strange that, you know, people dismissed it as folklore, or urban legend until in the 80s, firemen started, you know, testifying that, no, this is actually happening and pictures were being taken of it. And so then people started taking it more seriously, so much so the BBC did some investigative reporting into it and found indeed these pictures did remain. But what they found was that it was because they had been covered in fire retardant varnish. So mm. while everything burned, they did not. And so they were able to, you know, identify that. Mm. And so in a lot of cases, the ones that seem very much, um, you know, romanticized or almost like they're out of some movie, those can be explained through scientific means. But then there's other things where, you know, it, it leaves it open for interpretation, and it's not always something that can easily be explained. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and so I think that you have to take the testimony of the individuals into account at that point where, you know, they say, well, I, I bring this object home, and, and then these things started happening. And, um, you know, and and people will come in, religious leaders, they will come in and look at these objects and, and uh, determine that there's something to them. And what that something is? You know, everybody has an opinion, but we, we would know that it's at least it's not positive, and so you can rule that out. So, yeah, I, I would venture to say, if I had to go out on a limb, that it was at least, by at the very least, negative energy was attached to it. What would you like Power. readers... I'm sorry. 
No, I, I just said powerful negative energy. Powerful negative energy, yeah. What would you like readers to take away from evil archaeology? I, you know, what I think I would like them to take away from evil ar- archaeology is um, the idea of not being afraid. You know, um, that that's something that, you know, they I, I've heard people say that doubt is the enemy of faith. And I would say that fear is the enemy of faith. To doubt is to simply ask questions. And I think those those questions are what bring us closer to our faith, or at least can. But fear, you know, fear is something else. And it's, it's um, Aristotle said, fear is pain arising from the anticipation of evil. I think fear in and of itself can, can create a negative force around us that, you know, is, is not something that uh, was, is helpful. But in this book, you know, I look at all these different things and at the end of it, um, the question of whether or not there is evil, um, I think that we need to look at it in the context and, uh, you know, it's easy to become focused on sites and relics and miss that broader relevance of the discovery to human history and culture. And without context, sites like Stonehenge or Gobekli Tepe just turn into rocks and, Without context, demonic figurines and bearded satyrs just look cartoonish like little characters. And so we really need the context. And so evil archaeology, I think, can teach us that the evil we see in these sinister relics may actually just be a reflection of the evil that we fear in ourselves and each other. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) My guest is Dr. Heather Lynn. Her book is Evil Archaeology. Heather, please tell our listeners one more time where they can get your book and find out more about you and your work. You can find out more about me at www.drheatherlynn.com. And you can get my book anywhere on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and your local bookstores, indie bookstores. Definitely go to them. They need your help. Heather, thank you so much for joining us, and you have to come back. Please promise you'll come back. I promise. It's been so great speaking to you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>